because it's very unrealistic to be in a niche and being like, you know what, I'm gonna dominate this niche and gobble up 100% of the market share or even 20, 30%. That's very hard to do. But on the flip side, it's easier to say, hey, I'm gonna go after this multi-billion dollar market and I'm gonna gobble up 0.1% of it, right? You gobble up even something small, that's enough money where you're generating millions of dollars where it's meaningful. Welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast, Neil. Uh, thanks for having me. Really excited. Yeah, bam. One of my favorite topics to talk about is marketing. As you guys know, I am a marketer. And today I'm thrilled to report that we have one of the most legendary and popular marketers in the world joining us, and that's Neil Patel. If you don't know Neil, he's a digital marketer, a New York Times bestselling author, an entrepreneur, and an investor. After founding Crazy Egg, Kiss Metrics, and other multi million dollar companies, Neil now focuses on running his SEO tool, Uber Suggest, as well as his agency, NP Digital. Digital, which specializes in paid campaigns, SEO, social media, and content marketing. He's worked with global brands like Amazon, NBC, GM, HP, and Viacom, to name a few. So we're obviously very excited to talk with Neil. And in this episode, we're going to share his journey of how he became one of the world's most recognized internet marketers. He'll break down his biggest digital marketing tips. We'll try to cover everything from social media to email marketing to SEO. And lastly, we'll get his insight on marketing trends for 2023 and how we can future-proof content in the age of AI. So, Neil, like I mentioned earlier, you were one of our generation's most notable marketers, and you're basically a household name when it comes to marketers. So congratulations on all your success. (laughs) You're too kind. I I don't know if my name is that household, but uh, you're too kind. Well, when it comes to marketers, you are for sure. And you've always had an entrepreneurial and hardworking spirit. And I was surprised to learn, I didn't know this before I was researching for this podcast, that you actually started your first company when you were 16. And so I'd love to understand some of the jobs and experiences you had as a teenager in terms of the work that you did, and also how you ended up getting into internet marketing and dabbling into that just as a teenager. Yeah, so when I was a young kid, I always had a drive to make money, which isn't the best reason to start a business. But from everything, when I was like around 15, I was selling like CDs and music in high school, which right now people would be like, you're crazy. Why would people want CDs? But back then, that's how people listen to music. And from there, uh, sold you know, cable TV and stuff like that to parents without getting into too much detail. I probably shouldn't have done some of those things. (laughs) And then as I grew up, I was just like, you know what? I want a high paying job. And the reason I want a high paying job is my sister at the time was working for Oracle Consultant. And this Oracle Consultant was making like $120 an hour, sometimes like $200 plus an hour. That's a lot of money. And keep in mind, that's around 21 years ago. So 21, 22 years ago, that's even right now, even though when people are like, oh, I'm making a hundred bucks an hour, people would be ecstatic with that, right? 100, 200 bucks an hour, 20 plus years ago was much more than it is today. You could buy homes back then for a few hundred grand. You know, now you need a home for, depending on what city you live in, some cities you can't even get a home for under a million bucks. So my sister worked for this Oracle consultant. I started looking online for Oracle consulting jobs. So I went to the site called monster.com. It's not popular now. Everyone uses LinkedIn, which you know all about. But back then, people were using monster.com to find jobs. So I was typing in all these Oracle financial uh, consulting jobs, and I couldn't qualify for any of them. Didn't have a college degree. Didn't have Oracle certifications. So I was missing out just on a ton of revenue but I wanted that revenue. So I started taking nighttime college classes. And while I was taking nighttime college classes, at the same time, because they didn't qualify for any of those jobs, I noticed that monster.com was making hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm like, you know what? If I just replicate this business, even if I make 1% of what they make, I'll be a rich kid. So I created my own job website, paid some contractors that I found online, used the money I made from you know, picking up trash at a theme park to cleaning restrooms to selling CDs, get all the money that I could find, uh, raise, I think it was like 500 bucks or $900 from college kids, I mean, uh, high school classmates. So I would go to around my class, try to get money from some of them. 
and started the business, the job board, also was going to college at nighttime. Job board started getting more traffic, learned internet marketing on my own, did a ton of research, got traffic, but made no money. Literally just making zero money. I was devastated. I was like, I'm getting like 100,000 visitors a month. No money. This sucks. So I'm like, you know, forget this. I'm just going to go forward, go to college and wrap things up and just go get that Oracle certification. Just get the $100, $200 an hour. So I tried going down that route. And while I was in high school, still at 16 at this time, my first class was Speech 101. Gave a speech on how Google algorithm worked and how to get Google traffic. Someone in the class was working at a power supply manufacturer and they're just like, man, can we end up hiring you? My boss is looking for someone like you. I'm in sales here, brushing up on my sales skills. Hence, I'm in that speech class. But I know they're looking for someone who understands Google. So they gave me a gig. Long story short was for five grand a month. I was ecstatic. That's a lot of money. Even right now, mm -hmm. that's a lot of money. So 60 grand a year. I didn't know that I was what kind of impact I was making on that business. Eventually I found out I was driving around $25 million a year in revenue <laughs> to the business through online marketing. So then the owner of the company had a son, the son owned an ad agency. And then he introduced me to Blue Cross, Countrywide, uh, ING Direct, which was like the first online bank or what is one of the first well-known online banks. And he was giving me five grand a month per client and just arbitraging it and charging more on the other end. And over time, you know, I was around 16, 17 years old at this time. I was making 20 grand a month and that's how I got my start. It's so amazing. You know, it just goes to show that if you find your passion early, if you stay focused, you know, you've been doing this basically for two decades. Now your company is running, you know, ad campaigns, spending billions of dollars with, with huge global brands. Like you've totally made it. And it just goes to show how much you can do when you focus and you become like a true, true expert in your field. You're totally right. But I didn't learn the focus thing probably until... 13, 14 years into my entrepreneur journey. It was, it mm. was late. If I focus on from day one on doing the right things, I would have a much, much, much bigger business. But mm. that's a mistake that I learned uh, better late than never. I just wish I could turn back the clock and focus. Well, it's funny. Now we have like all these resources, like Young and Profiting Podcast, where we get to talk to Alex Ramosi and he schools us on how, like why we need to focus and all these things. So, uh, you know, it was a different situation when you first started. You didn't really have as much resources as everybody else. So speaking on, you know, getting your start, I've got a lot of young listeners and these young listeners often are really confused about where to focus their attention, how to find their passion, how to understand, you know, where they should focus in terms of their passion that will also make money. What's your advice to them, uh, you know, considering the fact that you've basically dominated this internet marketing niche? Uh, this is one of my favorite questions or topics, more so not really questions, but it's one of my favorite topics. I've met a lot of young people. They've asked me the same thing. I didn't know my passion would be internet marketing. Back then it wasn't really popular. And what I found is when we're born and we grow up and we start getting to elementary school, we have these ideas of what we want to be, astronaut, policeman, firefighter. You know, I wanted to be a doctor when I was a little kid. And people believe that a lot of others just know what they want to do and then they grow up and that's what they do. But that's not actually true. Majority of the people that I've met and talked to, and I also wrote a book called Hustle with, uh, I had co-authors, and we did a lot of research and we found that majority of the people aren't really born and be like, I want to be a doctor. And then they grow up being a doctor. The way most people find their passion is they actually try a lot of different things. And mm -hmm. typically the stuff that they're not good at, they just don't do much of, or if they don't like it, they just don't do much of. But typically what you find is when people try a lot of different things, they stumble on s upon stuff that they're naturally good at. And you tend to love the stuff that you're naturally good at. And you tend to be more passionate about it. And that's what you should end up focusing on. But the way you end up figuring it out is not spending 10,000 hours to master something. It's just a ton of trial and error and you just constantly try new things. I totally agree with you. And I think one of the reasons why you probably found your passion so early is because you were doing a lot even as a young kid and experimenting and getting a lot of experiences. Totally right. Did too many businesses. Yeah. Some I loved, some I hated, <laughs> but live and learn. 
Yeah, you you learned from it. Okay, so let's uh, talking about niches. Let's talk about picking your market. I know that selecting the right market when you're starting a side hustle or when you're becoming an entrepreneur is so important. And I was talking to you offline about how I have this LinkedIn masterclass. And I teach people how to grow on LinkedIn, how to master their content, go viral, how to convert leads into sales. But where I see them struggling is that they don't have product market fit. Their offer isn't really yeah. right. They don't really know who they're marketing to. And then and my strategies may not work if they don't have that all lined up and perfected. So I'd love to understand from you what makes a good audience uh, market. What makes a good audience market to me is a big TAM. So assuming you find something you're passionate about by just through trial and error, you got to make sure you're focusing on a big TAM. Everyone says the riches is are in the niches. That's far from true. If you look at the majority of the large corporations out there, like Tesla's automotive, right? People need cars in this world. If you look at Microsoft, everyone needs software to run these computers and digital devices that we're on. If you look at Google, we're relying on search for anything and someone organizing data and feeding it to us in a very organized fashion. If you look at Apple, we need all these hardware pieces that they're selling from headphones to cell phones to laptops, right? These are large markets. If you look again, look at the biggest companies in the world, they're going after large markets and not niches. So the key is to go after a big TAM. Now you can start in a niche if you want, and there's nothing wrong with that, but you need to make sure that you can expand that niche into a large market because the amount of effort it takes to market a business, whether it's on LinkedIn or any social platform or even SEO for a niche compared to a large market is almost the same amount of effort. Sure, it's harder in a large market, it takes longer to see results, but it's the same process and the same time and energy that you're putting into it. So might as well go after something big because it's very unrealistic to be in a niche and being like, you know what, I'm gonna dominate this niche and gobble up 100% of the market share or even 20, 30%. That's very hard to do. But on the flip side, it's easier to say, hey, I'm going to go after this multi-billion dollar market and I'm going to gobble up 0.1% of it, right? You gobble up even something small, that's enough money where you're generating millions of dollars where it's meaningful, right? For example, if it's a $10 billion market that you're going after, you gobble up 0.1%, that's big enough to create amazing life and a business. Totally. And just to define some things for my listeners who may not know, TAM is total addressable market. So you're saying you need a big sort of more broad market. You don't want to get too in the niches because they're really hard to find. That's like finding a needle in a haystack when you've got, uh, when you're a marketer, you want to find your audience in mass. You want to target them in mass. That's how you're going to target them in the cheapest way, most effective way. If you have to find like 10 people here, 10 people there, 10, it's like you are just going to exhaust yourself and it's going to be very expensive. Exactly right. You need to go after a big market so that way you don't have to have frequency issues of like, oh, I've shown my ad to 500 people. All right, how many more people can you show? Well, that's my only audience or even 10,000 people. It's not enough. You need to go after the masses. Yeah. So I know that you have a formula for marketing that you talk about. Could you break that down for us? Sure. So number one, go after a really big TAM. Once you have a big TAM, then if you want to do well, you need to take an omni-channel approach from LinkedIn to Facebook to Instagram to WhatsApp marketing through text, through email marketing to SEO to paid advertising. It doesn't matter if you like paid ads on Facebook or not. If it's profitable, it's profitable. You got to keep leveraging it. And then from there, you got to figure out how to add in the upsells and downsells because if you look at marketing over time, it continually costs more and more. So you got to add in the upsells and downsells. In other words, build that funnel, figure out how to generate more revenue from that same customer. And if they're buying more right at purchase, it allows you to spend more money on marketing as well as figure out a way to generate reoccurring revenue. So how do you sell to them multiple times? And it may not be reoccurring in the sense that most people think where someone's subscribing for $10 a month, but it could be reoccurring as simple as I built an amazing product or service. I have product market fit where I'm Amazon and people will just buy toothpaste from me. Oh, and the next day they'll buy toilet paper and then they buy some shoes and then they buy a t-shirt or a headphone or a laptop. And Amazon is continuing making money from you each and every single month, even though a lot of people aren't subscribing to reoccurring products. Mm. 
And I'd love to dig deeper on a couple of things that you mentioned. So can you help us understand some examples of an upsell and a downsell? Yeah, no problem at all. So with upsells and downsells, this key is speed and automation. I learned that from a guy named Ryan Dice and he was spot on on it. And I did a lot of testing and I found that if you're offering an upsell or a downsell, anything that gives a result faster or in an automated way tends to perform better. But to, but to keep it simple, before we go into that, let's just take McDonald's as an example. So with McDonald's, if you buy anything from McDonald's, at least when I was a little kid, they would say, would you like fries with that? That's an example of an upsell. You hmm. say, oh, I'm not sure. Oh, would you like uh, to supersize your meal? That's another example of an upsell. Or would you like a happy meal, right? And typically an upsell is you're selling something that could be more. So you order a burger and that is an upsell to get them into a happy meal or a combo where they're getting a drink and a fries. A downsell could be, hey, you want a burger? All right, cool. Uh, you already bought that. Would you like large fries? Oh no, it's too expensive. How about a small fries? We're running a promotion on that. It'll only cost you 30 cents more when you combine your burger with a small fry you don't even have to spend a dollar more. It's just 30 cents more. That's the example of a mm. downsell because you're getting them on a lower price point uh, when they're saying no to something that is more expensive. Mm. And typically what you want to do with your marketing is how can you sell something that will get them the results faster in an automated way? So let's use beauty as an example because it's the easiest uh, example that I can think of. Let's say people want wrinkle cream. You can probably tell I don't use wrinkle cream. But let's say wrinkle cream because people don't want wrinkles. If you say, hey, check out this light, it's purple or red or blue in color, and if you put it on your face, it'll get rid of the wrinkles faster. So you'll get smoother skin with less wrinkle or less wrinkles in quicker time. So instead of three months, maybe it'll take you only one month. That kind of upsell does really well because you're getting the results faster. Or mm. another way is, hey, here's some wrinkle cream. Here's this device that you can just wear when you sleep and it just puts it in your face for you overnight and it just injects it. I'm making it up. Or here's this toothbrush. Instead of buying it, here's this attachment that you can add on for another 50 bucks. And you just put it in your mouth and it brushes your mouth for you. That's the example of automation where people pay for that because they're like, oh, cool. So I can walk around my house while this device brushes my teeth for me and I'm good to go. Yeah. So- the reason why all of this is so important is because we want to increase the lifetime value of our customers, right? So every yes. customer costs a certain amount of money for us to acquire if we're using paid ads. Sometimes it's free if you're using organic strategies. And at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're increasing the LTV or lifetime value of our customers. So can you further break down your perspective on that or any tips around increasing lifetime value? So lifetime value is about how can you get people to keep just buying more and more from you, whether it's reoccurring or upsells or downsells? But the key to really increasing the lifetime value is just understanding what issues people have with your business, your products and services, and just talking to them and saying, hey, what can I do better? How can I more delight you? And just getting that feedback and adjusting your products and services is how you optimize the experience and increase your lifetime value. 